It's a joy, it's a privilege, it's a responsibility to look carefully to see where God is at work, to acknowledge his work, and to thank him for each and every evidence of his grace. But of course, it's also a responsibility to look carefully to see where we may be neglecting, we may be interfering with the good work that God means to do. In my last video, I pointed out six evidences of God's grace we've seen in and through the New Calvinism. Today, I want to turn to some of the movement's weaknesses to suggest areas we may do well to consider and to address. But first, let's have a little intro. The first danger we need to address is the danger of trendiness. Now, there was a time, and it really wasn't that long ago, when there were very few people who held to reform theology. There were very few significant churches or ministries that held to it. But we come to today, and now we find a whole host of big ministries and megachurches that are distinctly reformed. When you go to reform conferences, you see they're at full capacity. Reform seminaries, they're, they're bursting at the seams. We've come to this very different era. Now, this, this mainstreaming of, of the New Calvinism, that could point to a, a permanent shift within wider evangelicalism, but it could also point to the existence of a trend or a fad. We won't really know until that, that next big thing comes along, right? Because it's inevitable that at some point, Reformed theology will no longer be celebrated, no longer be cool. Eventually, books and conferences, they'll insist there's something newer, something better, something purer, something with, with greater promise. And it's only at that time that we'll learn how many of us are, are really just trend followers and how many of us are really committed, fully committed to the Reformed truth we've been talking about. That means that today, right now, this is a time for individuals, for churches, to ministries to ensure we are truly committed to this biblical truth as it's defined or summarized by Reformed theology and not just riding some wave. A second danger is the danger of celebrityism. Any movement is led by its leaders, of course. That's obvious. That's unavoidable. But eventually, a movement needs to question the place of its leaders. It needs to consider, what would this movement be without our leaders? So just as new Calvinists need to consider whether we're just following the latest trend, the, the coolest trend, we also need to consider whether we're simply following along behind some trend setters, whether we've just engage with these exciting leaders and are following along behind them. Like New Calvinism has already committed a few really big gaffes in relation to celebrity. We've, we've handed position and influence to church and, and ministry leaders who, who are unworthy. They prove themselves very quickly unworthy of what we gave them. So each of us then needs to ask, are we merely following along behind some exciting and dynamic leaders, or do we really understand? And do we really believe? Do we really hold to? these theological convictions. A third danger for the new Calvinism is this danger of pride. There, there are few dangers in the world greater than the dangers that come with recognition. And let's be honest, for many years, Calvinism had little to fear from the danger of recognition. But this growth of new Calvinism has brought that recognition. That This movement is growing. It's, it's beginning to exert influence on church and culture. And with influence, with recognition, comes a dangerous temptation to pride. Maybe that's seen through snide comments about other believers, about people who hold other theological convictions. Maybe it's seen in, in looking down at anyone who, who attempts to lovingly critique us or our movement. Maybe it's seen in a failure to really seriously self-assess the movement and, and its ministries and its emphases and its leaders. Whatever that temptation, it will begin first within the hearts of individuals. And then it'll start to manifest itself through their thoughts and through their words and through their actions and then through the whole movement. I, I can tell you, new Calvinism will inevitably fade and fail if it allows itself to become self-congratulatory, if, if it becomes, ironically, unwilling to keep reforming. A fourth danger is the danger of boundaries. As this movement grows, it's facing challenges in defining and maintaining boundaries about who's part of this movement and who's not. So there's no central government, right, with, with jurisdiction over the new Calvinism. So these boundaries, they're being negotiated by the movement as a whole. Now, from its earliest days, new Calvinism deliberately drew together, let's say, Presbyterians and Baptists. Then as time went on, it, it expanded to all sorts of other traditions and many other denominations, well and good. It then agreed that it would welcome both 
cessationists and charismatics as long as they both agree to align on the centrality of the gospel and on these few points of Reformed theology. But at around the same time, it agreed it would largely reject egalitarians, that it would be complementarian by its definition. It has its boundaries. Any movement needs boundaries. That's not a bad thing. But those boundaries must be drawn with wisdom and with charity. So, uh, so a danger the new Calvinism faces is the danger of drawing boundaries either too loosely or too rigidly, and to do both without wisdom or without charity. A fifth danger of the new Calvinism is the danger of homogeneity. As human beings, we tend to be most comfortable with people who are most similar to us. Like We love ourselves, so it's easy to love people like us. And it's for this very reason that our church communities tend to be uniform instead of diverse. Unless we're deliberately applying the gospel to our churches, they'll inevitably become less and less rather than more and more diverse until eventually they're really just made up of people like us, people from one socioeconomic background, one ethnicity, or or one set of views over even disputable matters. And movements are prone to that same temptation. Well, New Calvinism has largely been led and it's been shaped and it's been been defined by Caucasian, American, upper middle class men. And for that reason, it inevitably has the flavor, it has the biases of Caucasian, American, upper middle class men. That's not a bad thing, but it's a thing. At the same time, this movement has diversified, right? It's drawing in Christians of many nations, many ethnicities, many levels of richness and poverty. Diversity brings the responsibility, it brings the privilege of listening to diverse voices and hearing them and being willing to be changed by them. Our desire is not to make them exactly like us, but to have us become more like them. Final danger to the new Calvinism is the danger of cold theology. It's a a movement defined by its theology, very fond of its theology. So there's this terrible temptation to emphasize theology in place of the God of the theology. Really, there's a danger in confusing Calvinism with Christianity, the doctrines of grace with the gospel of grace. We need to always acknowledge the Christian world is wider than mere Calvinism. Now, we do believe that Calvinism is the purest expression of biblical truth, right? If we didn't believe that, we wouldn't hold to it. But it's not the only one. God doesn't call us to save people to Calvinism, not as a matter of first priority. We shouldn't want to be known or loved for our desire to be Calvinists. Rather, our desire to love others, to do good for them, to draw attention to the God who saved us. Look, it's too early to predict with any accuracy how how history will regard the new Calvinism, or even if it will remember it at all. But it's not too early for us to consider and to determine how that history will be written. Look, if, if new Calvinism is just a trend, if it's a movement, if it's a marketing machine, then let's just let it die. But if it really does represent doctrine that the Bible makes plain, if it really does represent a movement of people who are committed to glorifying God by living for the good of others, well, then let's be sure that we're rejoicing at what God has done, that we're thanking him for each and every evidence of his grace, and that we're looking for, and we're identifying, and we're addressing every potential weakness. Let's be utterly relentless in our pursuit of God so he can be glorified in and by all the nations. Let's keep reforming. Hope you found the video helpful. If you did, why don't you hit hit the like button or consider subscribing, and I hope to see you again soon.